Uh, welcome back, everybody. So I hope you all had a good group out group breakout group discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, I was trying to say group out break discussion, sir. Uh, and uh, now we have the breakout reports back, and we have we as we said we combined it and made it three groups. So we have Ed, Stephanie, and Ali, and each of them will speak for ten minutes on the same. Uh, uh, formats of the PowerPoint slides. So, uh, go ahead. Who, who's first on that? Okay, that's it. There you go. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so again, just first, you know, I'm I'm talking for the group, but if anyone from our session has any comments or I misrepresent anything, um, please speak up. So again, we went through systematically, question by question, and um, for the first one related to challenges and opportunities, uh, I think you know the, the the big one that came up was uh, access to data, the in situ data availability. Um, in in addition to the data that you know the data that is available, the the data, the methods, the models, uh, uncertainty and bias. So quantifying and and, un and getting a sense of the actual uncertainties and bias. Uh, with what we have, uh, we think is also a challenge. And then human aspects uh, in in their role in the water cycle, uh, characterizing that, understanding that, quantifying that in terms of you know you know qualitatively, but also to a degree that could be integrated into various models. Uh, and so those the first three represent really the the challenges, and the next couple of bullets. Uh, we focused more on the opportunities. So the first one was uh, more data fusion. So and we know there's, there's data fusion activities taking place, but you know, uh, a larger effort put into data fusion with the available data that we do have. Um, integrating modeling and science uh, centers in, in terms of you know, more integrated models that capture the adaptive feedbacks from multiple spatial and temporal scales as well as processes. Um, in terms of the, the physical processes, it was also the human um, aspects of these systems. Models that integrate all of that um, is an opportunity. Uh, ability to obtain water quality and quantity via sensors and the, the Internet of Things. So the idea is there are lots of sensor capabilities out there now that aren't huge money. Um, if that's connected to the Internet, getting access to that data is something then we could do, start to do on a, on a large scale. Um, an investment in translating water cycle understanding to local regional policy and management. And again, so the idea is, you know, um, we have various understandings, we have things going on in, in, in various places, expanding that, um, uh, to link it, to link what we basically do to the policy and the management aspects of things, um, focusing on that in the future is an opportunity. So, uh, f does anyone have anything else? I don't know how you want to do these. We want to do question by question, or just kind of go through as a whole, or. Okay, uh, I'm representing the uh, orange and green groups. We had a good discussion. Um, so uh, we, um, to answer the question, what are the challenges and opportunities uh, for future research, we, we um, kind of broke out in both opportunities and challenges, and although we discovered that some of our opportunities were the same as the challenges. Um, so first, in terms of opportunities, uh, we the group felt that you know remote sensing is really in its in its infancy in a lot of ways for for groundwater um, monitoring, and that as those um, technologies improve uh, and new ones become available, um, you know, thirty years from now we're going to be asking ourselves how how we ever. Uh, monitored groundwater today. We talked about CubeSats, uh, airborne instruments, weather balloons, UAVs, um, 
uh, cell phone uh, signals, et cetera. Um, we uh, talked a lot about how to leverage remote sensing data and to um, compare with models. Um, we, there were, are a lot of uh, challenges uh, with remote sensing, um, uncertainties, biases. How do we get a better understanding of those? Um, we uh, talked about integrating the need to integrate remote sensing and in situ data um, and challenges and opportunities associated with those. Uh, we talked about improved technology for in situ data. Um, the, uh, you know, there's more and more remote sensing data, but in a lot of ways, um, the, the um, trove of in situ data is not expanding, uh, and it's often expensive uh, as well. So um, how do we collect that data? How do we share that data? Are there um, uh, um, standards, et cetera? We talked about EM systems and potentially an earth scope type campaign. Uh, probably in the U.S., um, <laughs> more sophisticated modeling and advances in computing power. Uh, we said, um, talked about um, the fact that there are just a few people um, running these large models, um, but how do we do a better job of taking advantage of those advances and share the results with the broader community? Um, we talked a lot about... Um, well, this is large-scale model accessibility, the barriers to entry. Uh, U.S. We, groundwater modeling and information exchange, um, using remote sensing to guide requests for water sampling. So how do we prioritize regions where, uh, uh, rather than looking at the globe as a whole, can we use remote sensing to help us prioritize uh, regions for more focused uh, studies? Um, we also discussed um, uh, new data techniques. Um, this was kind of folded up and talking about formats as well. There's uh, artificial intelligence, these new knowledge discovery techniques, machine learning. How do we take care of those techniques? In terms of challenges, uncertainties, uh, how do we characterize the uncertainties, not only in the data but in the modeling output, biases? Uh, the raw data, in particular the INSAR, needs a lot of processing. So how do we share that data when it requires a lot of processing and knowledge to understand it? Uh, we need transparency in the data underlying the data sets, whether they're direct or, or it's inferred. Um, we talked about um, the need for more information on the deep aquifer systems um, and components that are really hard to get to. Um, again, model evaluation is not only an opportunity, it's a challenge. So what parts of these data sets should be used for validation? And then um, we talked a lot about international partnerships, and that will also show up in the fourth question uh, on, on a project-by-project -project basis. Um, then uh, one of our call-in folks talked about the sparseness of in-situ monitoring in rural data sets. So, um, we are data rich with remote sensing, data poor oftentimes with in situ data sets, and so how do we, how do we, uh, how do we harmonize those challenges? I think to go back to the yellow group. Right. Uh, ours are structured uh, similar to the blue group. The first few comments are the challenges, and then we talk about the opportunities. So uh, like others, the lack of in-situ data was the primary concern that was uh, raised by everyone uh, that relates to groundwater level, pumping rates, um, uh, stream flow data, and also the um, frequency and the um, spatial and temporal coverage of the um, different in-situ data that are available. Scale issues of groundwater extent and other related variables, um, depending on the, um, the basin we are talking about, depending on the data sets such as GRACE, depending on the um, communities that we are talking about, there's a lot of scale issues that come into play here. Um, diversity of purpose of the measurements, why are we actually taking the measurements? What is the goal? What is the audience? And uh, one point that we came back again and again is to that we are trying to measure an 
unnatural system. There is a lot of human involvement through all the, in every layer, and um, there is no way to uh, get sufficient data on the human and societal factors. And I think we talk about that in the later questions as well. Um, one point was raised is that uh, an we could we could look at it as an opportunity is that looking at um, the systems dynamics of um, groundwater uh, issues and looking at a systems point of view, um, and then the other major point that was raised was the uncertainties. How do we measure them? Where are the uncertainties uncertainties coming from, and how do we um, reduce them depending on uh, our knowledge of where they're coming from and how do we incorporate that into decision making. So these were the major, um, I guess, challenges as well as opportunities that we can um, address in our future endeavors. Thank you. Okay, so let's go back to the first group and do the second question. And let's hold all our comments till the end because Otherwise, I think we, I'm afraid we'll run out of time. Okay, so again, what data are most useful in determining the freshwater budgets, and what information will be useful to have uh, to have that we currently struggle to collect? Um, so in this one, again, some of the things, the data that would be most useful, you know, precipitation, water storage, discharge, um, you know, the close the water budget. Uh, we also talked about the spatial temporal scales and measurements depend on the questions being asked and the system complexity. So depending on, again, what you're asking, where you're asking it, the, the data that we need change, also the spatial temporal resolution of that data changes. Um, and, and again, the second bullet is really getting at the, the, the sort of the built human system, so getting data on the, the water usage, yeah, you know, how much you're taking, and then the consumption aspect of that. So maybe you're taking 100,000 gallons per day or something, and you're only using 80% of that or something. But there's the usage and then the actual consumption, various transfers out of, the, out, of a, out of a system, and then there's losses within a system that we really have very limited data on. Uh, Again, I think the, one of the other groups talked about this a little bit for bullet one, but the dy dynamic aspects of the water budget and the interactions and impacts with infrastructure. So, you know, looking at a system, you know, at a particular snapshot in time tells you something. Um, but, you know, some of these systems change dramatically uh, based on season uh, or there's major trends taking place now related to potentially climate change or, again, human ac activities in a region. Um, and then we also talked a little bit about extremes. So, you know, when you have an extreme drought or flood, um, you know, that's something that uh, it'd be more uh, nice to have more data on. Uh, and again, the spatial temporal scales, uh, we talked a little bit about, it kind of relates to this, the, that, the first bullet, but, you know, you have scales at, you know, the farmer scale, the individual field, the individual stretch of river to the watershed or the climate scale. And again, depending on what you're asking, you really you know, have very different scales to think about. Uh, and, and then information on human decision making related to economics and impacts on, on water budgets. So there's the financial piece driving a lot of these things and decisions are being made and then that's ultimately impacting the water budget. And so having that connected piece, understanding how the economics come into play to the decisions that are made. Um, and then groundwater in general, and then this point was brought up, you know, depending on your interest in the groundwater, is it a store or is it a flux? So like what's your interest in groundwater? It kind of changes the way you look at um, the system and what you're trying to capture. Where, again, if you're thinking of it as, a, you know, it's a resource that's just there or are you really focused on the fluxes in and out of it to balance whatever it is you're working on in your system. So that's all we had for that. Um, so we came up with some uh, 
very, <laughs> very similar responses. Um, for us, uh, the primary fluxes are most important, precipitation, et cetera, um, in terms of data. Uh, we also felt that we needed to have a better understanding of the human industrial and irrigation use, uh, not, so not just the natural system, but we also need to have uh, m more information about how data are actually used. Um, we talked about the need for 3D data and how is that integrated into models, again, along with, with point data or, or other data. Um, we, we need these hydrogeologic subsurface variables. Um, we did talk about, and this sort of carried on from the previous discussion, about prioritizing uh, on a global scale. Um, and um, we, uh, the group felt that the priorities depends on the, on the process, um, that, um, that we have to understand the need in order to, to uh, prioritize data. Um, we talked about uh, understanding large-scale uh, data systems and about uh, closing the water budget, but there was one dream, I forget who said that, but uh, they, we don't have everything without isotopes. Uh, it is important for helping us to understand uh, residence time for modeling studies and assessing sustainability. Um, we uh, talked about the need for subsidence data uh, that would, and other remote sensing, this is again back to the previous, that could give us some indication of where we prioritize uh, studies. Um, we, again, this is uh, similar, this is a refrain we've heard from others, that the importance and the need to have data-driven models that integrate both in situ and remote sensing. Um, we talked a lot about where the data go. Um, and so where do we store the data? Is it, uh, there's was some discussion about uh, universities perhaps storing the data. We talked about um, uh, how FAS serves data sets. Can FAS or, or USDA uh, serve data? Um, and there was an example that was given in terms of storing data. The quasi example was one. Um, but there was the USGS example that was, or not USGS, I'm sorry, it was a seismic community uh, has developed a repository called Iris uh, Pascal for seismic data that could be uh, a model for groundwater data. Um, and uh, we talked about how important it is to pursue international partnerships in order to increase access to data globally. Um, in terms of um, data that are most useful, in situ data um, uh, came up. Uh, water quality data, that was one issue that we um, definitely thought was very important. Soil data, and then all the land surface. I mean, we started writing all the variables, but then all the land surface um, and hydrological data that is, um, that variables that are there. But water quality uh, came out again as very important because it's very site specific and local level contaminations and biogeochemistry and um, the dynamic uh, nature of it that uh, remains as a key hurdle. Um, one question that came up was that how much in situ data do we really need? How much do we need to complement the remote sensing data so that we can validate as well as uh, think that uh, we can move forward and um, continue with our studies. Um, in terms of uh, that information that would be useful uh, is maps of um, groundwater recharge, rates of recharge, well locations that came up that could be a very good product that um, could be used to assess freshwater budgets and then um, training data for new techniques, so machine learning and all those new techniques that are coming up, where do we get the training data for those from so that we can develop and validate and um, sharpen these new techniques? That's it. Now to question three, please. Okay, so what aspects of freshwater balance beyond precipitation and SWE data would uh, benefit from NGA resources? Um, so again, 
there's lots of stuff out there. We, we focused on, you know, some of the things that if, you know, resources were allocated, you know, these are the priority areas. Uh, uh, so, again, so some of the things that are just difficult to measure, uh, river, river discharge, and I have degree of regulation, which has a lot of stuff that follow here. Um, but the idea is we have data. You know, it could be in a river discharge. It could be groundwater data. Knowing more about the system for which the data was collected in terms of is it a, if it's a well and they're pumping water, is it used for... You know, irrigation, is it used for municipal purposes? What, what's the purpose of the data? Is it a natural system? Is it a managed system, a regulated system? You know, we get this data, but we don't often know the system context for which the data is used. Um, so a focus on that aspect of data. Uh, and again, some of the things that basically the list of remotely sensed data products that are out there, except the addition of water use, and then bringing it all back to characterization of the hydrologic uh, you know, variables, processes, the system characteristics. Uh, we also often think about data products as the quantities that we're interested in, but having the, the variables, the parameters that go into the model would also be a value. Uh, the natural language processing of historical data. So again, thinking of ways to get uh, access to some of the data that exists that is just in a, a different format. Uh, and then this also got us thinking about a centralized data storage location. Again, we talked about Kwasi or, you know, other places, but having a location where everyone felt comfortable having the data that, again, is often not shared uh, for various reasons, that's going to be a sensitive topic, but having a place for that could be very useful. Uh, and the one example was the disaster index uh, insurance uh, related to water I don't know why I have sources, but I was thinking water hazards here. You know, there, there are places where you can go to for uh, earthquakes. And if there's a, an event, you know, someone tells you there's a database, central location, the insurance companies pay based on what that source says happened during a time. Uh, maybe there's something related to groundwater uh, that could, you know, be developed, something similar to that. Uh, community-abled cyber infrastructure, example was like EarthCube, um, and development of potential technologies or actions that could help understand or manage the water budget. So again, what could we add to the system that would help us characterize it, uh, maybe more real-time and, and uh, improve the way it operates, and the technology side of things in terms of monitoring as well as uh, the ability to, to change the system. Oh, <laughs> sorry, lost for a sec. Um, so uh, one thing uh, that we, well, I heard somebody say funding, but it didn't show up on the list. Um, <laughs> uh, we talked about uh, potentially as a steward for airborne campaigns. Um, that might be uh, difficult in, um, in other countries. Uh, so where possible, it uh, gives us that high resolution data. Um, we also wanted, uh, thought that data on human water usage and infrastructure is critical, uh, reservoirs, uh, et cetera, uh, irrigation use if, if available. Um, the parameters that are used in the models are absolutely essential, and it can be in uh, areas where data are sparse. Um, they can be difficult to get, so that would be very helpful. Um, observations of uh, water levels and storage. Um, declassified water data, um, if it's available. Uh, partnerships to improve instruments or models. Um, so partner, partnering with NGA, for example. Um, changes in drinking water supplies, especially near cities. Um, we talked about uh, having an understanding of mining effects uh, and effects on communities. Um, we have uh, examples where it's been very difficult to get river discharge data. The Nile is one. I think if the current data is eight years old. Uh, so current data, discharge data from the Nile, from the Ganges, and from other rivers. Um, data on different scales uh, is important, especially local scales. Um, weather data, uh, underground structure 
if, if possible. And this is related back up to the human water usage and infrastructure, but where, where it's possible, uh, metered irrigation data. So we looked at um, where the new um, the new types of um, activities or data sets that where NGA could devote his resources for, and uh, we talked talked about um, drone based measurements um, for to cover for in situ uh, data sets, improved computational resources, and image processing such as. Um, going through Landsat for all the um, well locations that used as an example. Metadata standards. Uh, so metadata on what sort of data we might ask from NGA or the types of data NGA could share with the other agencies or with uh, unclassified data that could be shared with academics and other institutions. Um, it could, uh, NGA could uh, um, facilitate academic research collaborations. That way we could exploit or um, work on the existing remote sensing data sets to uh, use for groundwater um, based studies. And interdisciplinary uh, collaborations, um, such as NGA already uh, works with Department of State on the Worldwide Human Geography um, Data Working Group. So uh, projects like that, um, NGA could um, sponsor more to work with other agencies. The last question. All right, so what are some examples of the successful collaboration opportunities, and what are the promising partnerships that could uh, help advise our understanding? Um, so again, from, from the, the collaborative side of thing, a real focus on new funding possibilities for interdisciplinary research. And this is just pointing to some existing uh, programs that, that focus on the interdisciplinary aspect. But again, thinking beyond the groundwater system of really bringing in the human aspect to that. And so studies that are, that are bridging both the, the physical and the, the human uh, aspects of these systems. Um, and I think for most of these, we just kind of listed out, the, again, the, the, the big piece was a focus on interdisciplinary research. It allows you to look at both sides of the problem. And then the rest is just potential partners that, we, that, that seem obvious for this type of work at a, at a global scale. Um, and then, again, the last piece was, again, bringing in the, the insurance world is also you know, quite vested in, in a lot of these things. And this is another avenue for potential uh, collaborations uh, that go beyond just the, the, the scientific or the, the nonprofit groups. So we, uh, we uh, talked about a number of different examples and some um, promising partnerships. Um, for in terms of examples, uh, USGS uh, had a uh, project in Brazil uh, mapping irrigated land, um, which was quite successful. It was an example of a successful collaboration. Um, the Advisory Committee for Water Informa Information has a subcommittee on groundwater, and uh, that I think could be a potential partnership as well as an example of, um, of interagency coordination. Um, the um, National Groundwater uh, Monitoring Network uh, is an example of uh, collaboration and something that we could contribute to. Um, the, there was an example of a partnership in Israel uh, working on groundwater and surface water. Um, the um, and this was through USDA. USDA also has relationships with Jordan, China, and Britain. Um, USGS had some examples of collaborations in a number of different countries where they've uh, developed a groundwater model. Um, I believe that was the Nubian aquifer example. 
Um, the uh, NASA Applied Sciences Program works with um, a number of different agencies, both in-country as well as internationally, uh, and I think the other uh, group also brought up Applied Sciences. NASA Servir is another example, NASA USAID Servir, I should say. Uh, we talked about the Infuse um, project where researchers write proposals um, and uh, get funded uh, to do their work. Signals in Soil is USDA. It's, that's in partnership with uh, NSF, and it, uh, both can fund um, international activities. Uh, NSF Pyre, uh, Coasts and People, um, we're not sure, though, that groundwater could be tied to these. Um, the USDA has a, a new water quality sub-priority, um, and um, they are funding proposals, um, and groundwater may be underfunded. This is called the Agricultural Food Research Initiative, and I think they're due August 1st is what I heard. Yes. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the USGS is undergoing a... Um, uh, modernization effort, the National Water Information System is being, um, is uh, becoming modernized and that's a potential for partnership. Uh, our list is much smaller. Uh, there were a few successful uh, examples that were um, talked about, the um, FAO uh, water accounting um, <coughs> project that was uh, brought on as one of the successful examples. The NASA collaboration with the UN environmental groups, especially the UN SDG, um, the Sustainable Development Groups, um, Sustainable Development Goals work, um, I think under the GEO uh, banner, as well as the other um, GEO, the Group on Earth Observations project, the GEO GLOWS on Global Water Sustainability. And the GRACE uh, program was brought on as an example of uh, similar successful work where gravimetric measurements have been used successfully for groundwater measurements. That's it. So those were the breakout reports. And as you can see, there's many similarities. And I mean, thankfully, there's no contradictions. <laughs>